Thank you so much for that introduction, Sarah, and it's such an honor and privilege to be here. Um, yes, I, um, I'm going to be um, jettisoning this country temporarily, but I'm not leaving you behind. I, I'll still be continue to be involved. So, um, so anyway, I, uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about. Um, well, marginalized voices, racial trauma, and the psychedelic healing movement. First, I want to say that we are all we are honored and excited that you are joining us this weekend. So, this is a few members of our of our workshop team from a recent um, retreat that we did to make sure that we were all really prepared for you. And um, so, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I have a couple of things to talk about. Some of these are hard things. Uh, you may as um, Sarah pointed out, feel uncomfortable at times, and I invite you to sit with and embrace that discomfort uh, if it arises in you. Um, we will be talking a little bit about racism, and there are many forms of racism. You may be most familiar with old-fashioned racism. That's the kind of racism where you know people run around at night in white hoods and with tiki torches frightening um, people. And, um, and generally, most of us recognize that, that this is somewhat um, inappropriate, uh, also known as sort of traditional bigotry. Uh, that being said, there are many other kinds of racism that have arisen up, although certainly it seems like there is a resurgence of this traditional bigotry, unfortunately. Um, and, and so these more subtle kinds of racism often People say they're unintended, um, and some, we make a big distinction between intended versus, un, versus unintended, but the consequences are the same for, uh, for those of us who are, are targets or victims or who are oppressed by it. And um, bad intent is almost always denied by perpetrators, even the ones in, in this category. Um, so conscious intent is not necessary to perpetrate racism. Um, overt feelings of hate and prejudice are not needed to perpetrate racism. And, um, and there's many other kinds of racism, so symbolic or modern racism is when people may embrace negative stereotypes about people of color or may believe that certain groups are morally inferior to other groups or have a deficient or defective culture. Uh, we have other race, types of racism that are seen more commonly in more um, uh, uh, progressive or liberal groups, such as aversive racism, where people say they support equality, but they still have negative or conflicted feelings toward people of color, and often this is unconscious. And there are many ways that, um, that this racism manifests, and it can be covert. Uh, for example, we may talk about microaggressions, which are small, um, small incidents of racism which are not obvious to the perpetrators, but may be very obvious to the targets. And, um, and, uh, and we also have something called structural racism. And this is the type of racism that is, um, that is baked into all of our systems, right? Because given that almost no one admits to being a racist today, and yet racism persists. So how, how is this? And it's, it's in here, it's in us, it's in our movement, unfortunately. So because it's structural in nature, um, and it's woven into nearly all of our social systems, uh, we end up having outcomes that tend to be unfair. We have policies and practices that benefit white Americans at the expense of people of color. And individual and structural racism exist in synergy, each supporting the other. And so all of our work today, as well-intentioned as it is, occurs under the umbrella of white supremacy. And as an example, I'm going to show you uh, some Unfortunate statistics, why are we here today? Uh, we're here today to, uh, in part, train more therapists of color to do MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And, um, and again, structural racism can exist even when no individuals are, are racist, creating unequal outcomes. And here we see, as of last year, all of the therapists who have been trained to do MDMA therapy are, for the most part, largely white with just under 10% um, being people of color, and that number includes some internationals. And um, we had some recent um, revisiting of some of these numbers because this was one of the things that prompted us to have this uh, training and event in the first place. Um, and 
and doing a survey of all of the uh, therapists, um, the MAPS uh, phase three therapists, we see pretty similar numbers with 90% um, of the therapists being white and um, not even one African American therapist. So these are, pretty, these are pretty bleak numbers. And we need, we desperately need, psychedelic therapists of color to take these medicines back to their communities. And so this prompted a, um, an article I wrote, uh, Psychedelic Therapy is Coming and Who Will Be Included? Um, and also, this prompted this event, which will be the uh, largest cohort of psychedelic therapists of color ever to receive this training. So we're so excited about that. And we have over 50 therapists um, who are going to be receiving, uh, over 50 therapists of color who are going to be receiving the training this week, which is going to be a huge game changer, I think, for the landscape and is going to bring in some much needed uh, wisdom, perspectives, energy, um, and just, just so many wonderful things that I think have been so essential and missing from this otherwise great movement. Okay. And so one of the things we're going to be talking about today is racial trauma. Um, and I want to give an example. I have, unfortunately, no um, unlimited examples of racial trauma. Uh, this is a case of someone I'll call Luther, who in August of 2016 was driving to college um, in Mississippi from his home in California. Uh, and while passing through Texas, he found himself approaching a police checkpoint in El Paso. Um, which worried him and also alerted him to the fact that he was going the wrong way. He had veered off his, his correct path. So he made a U-turn as he realized that there was not supposed to be this police check on his route um, because he was going the wrong, realized he was going the wrong way. Well, the police spotted him turning around. And what do you think they did? They said, hmm, a black man making a U-turn um, and pulled him over. And then the officer asked to search his car. Um, he said, okay. Um, and in the trunk, the officer found, uh, after rifling through all of his things, an empty medicine vial in his backpack, um, which he thought was kind of cool. It was glass. He was going to use it as a shot glass. Um, but the officer said, no, this is drug paraphernalia. And he said, I could lock you up for three months for this and insisted that his trunk smelled like marijuana, which it did not, because he didn't have any marijuana. And so then they brought over police dogs and searched his car uh, with the police dogs. And the police dogs supposedly did not find anything in the trunk that supposedly reeked of marijuana, but did, did indicate somehow that it smelled something on the door of the car, <clears throat> which was bizarre, because he had just had it washed. And, um, and then the officer asked Luther to return to his vehicle and follow them to a remote checkpoint for further inspection. Well, at this point, Luther was starting to get really nervous and scared. And he saw the police were being unreasonable and making accusations that he knew weren't true. And he started to wonder what would happen to him if he followed the police out to the remote checkpoint. So when he got in his car, instead of following the police, he sped away. And um, he was driving through the, the desert. Um, it was a national park. And eventually, he um, had to get out of the car, and he fled on foot. And um, police eventually recovered his vehicle. No drugs were found in the vehicle. No weapons were found um, in Luther's car. And a year later, he was apprehended in California and brought to Texas to face his outstanding charges. He was denied bail and placed in a federal prison awaiting trial, charged with felony evasion from police. So given that he had no drugs and no weapons, why did Luther run, right? So we'll be thinking about that as we go. Um, racism is real and systemic. Here's an, here's an example um, uh, comparing black people to white people. Some people say maybe racism against white people is now as bad as it is against black people. Well, as far as we can tell by every economic, economic social, and educational indicator, this isn't the case. Um, a typical black household has accumulated less than about a tenth of the wealth of a typical white one. 
and it's only getting worse. In the past 25 years, the wealth gap between blacks and whites has nearly tripled, according to research by Brandeis University. And, um, and on top of that, there are also uh, gaps in terms of who graduates from college. The, actually, the racial gap in who's graduating has widened since 2007, with black and Latino students slipping further behind in college graduation rates. It's um, not just uh, economic indicators, but health as well, where we see the uh, shocking difference in infant mortality rates between black and white babies, with, um, with black people's babies dying at twice, over twice the rate of white babies. Um, maternal mortality, um, also incredibly high, as well as, if, as well as several other indicators of health, such as childhood obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, so African Americans have the highest death rate and shortest survival of any racial and ethnic group in the US for most cancers as well. And um, black women are much more likely to have pregnancy complications that shouldn't even be an issue in developed countries. Why is this? Um, our own research has found uh, anti-black bias across the US. And um, in order to get this data that I'm about to show you, we looked at the data from Project Implicit, which is um, a study that runs at Yale that collects data nationwide and worldwide on, um, on bias in different, different types of bias. I happened to download the, the data for their black-white implicit attitudes test. And, um, and I calculated the mean scores for each US state for uh, white people by state and everyone for each state. And I color-coded the states based on the scores using the following key where um, we have um, the most uh, anti-black bias as on the, in the positive uh, arena, like a positive one, and the uh, highest anti, um, I mean, I'm sorry, anti-black, uh, slight anti-black bias or no bias at a zero, and then the strongest pro-black bias would be negative numbers, uh, none of which you see here. And so if we look at, if we've categorized this as low bias, let's say as a green, and keeping in mind that these are all not zeros, so there is still bias, and then a stronger bias at this red, where um, we have the higher numbers, this is what our, our country looks like in terms of bias, um, just looking at white people. And as you can see, some places are more biased than others. Among white participants, the least biased live in Oregon, and uh, the most biased live in North Dakota, and a few other places that I try not to visit, like South Carolina and New Jersey. Um, I don't know what's going on with New Jersey. Um, and, but if we add everybody into the mix, we see our country looks a little different. We see the same patterns, um, but less, less anti-black bias. Um, and we see the least biased place to live is Washington, D.C., followed by Georgia, and the most bias is still in North Dakota, so definitely don't go there. Um, and and, these, these, um, and this is not just academic, these are actually connected to health outcomes. For example, we see higher black mortality rates in places where there is more bias and also more preterm births and um, low birth weight among black babies. So, uh, so these biases have real consequences, which um, are life-threatening. And, um, and to be clear, though, I've given you a lot of data about, about African Americans, but um, people of, all people of color are affected. Um, this affects all genders, all ages, and people from all groups. Research shows that racism is um, pretty strongly uh, connected to just about every mental health condition that we've examined. And, um, and this research has only been done in the last 20 years, but for every condition we study, we look at the correlation to racism and it's there. And there have even been some prospective studies where they followed people 
um, and had them record their mood and experiences of racism that they encountered, and we see connections to um, to symptoms that they're having. So, so we know this is harmful, and um, and it is actually a I would say it's definitely a major public health concern. So, um, how do these things operate? Well, they operate through what we call false or pathological stereotypes. These are ideas about people of color that don't necessarily correspond with reality. Um, here are a few examples of false beliefs about people of color. For example, a uh, false belief that black people have a higher pain tolerance. So what does that look like when you're a black person going to the doctor and you need medicine for pain? Uh, you're not gonna get it as in, in the same way that the white patients are gonna get it. You're not gonna get as much medicine when you're delivering a baby, per se. Um, and you're not gonna be listened to when you're being arrested and you're told your handcuffs hurt, right? So, um, so there's real consequences for this. Um, other, other false stereotypes include things like black fathers not being present, even though um, research from the CDC shows that they're actually more involved with their children uh, than their white counterparts. Um, stereotypes that most black people are poor, and although statistically on average do have lower incomes due to oppression, most black people are not poor. Um, that black youth abuse more drugs, which is also not true. They are less likely to abuse drugs than white and Hispanic counterparts. And then finally, that people of color are not true Americans. Um, here we have uh, recently President Trump tweeted that four Democratic Congresswomen should go back to where they came from, even though all of them are US citizens and three of them were born here. Um, so his comments were fueled by stereotypes that people of color are not real Americans and don't belong here. And so all of these things contribute to what we call cultural trauma. Uh, people of color tend to have higher rates of PTSD and some of this is from large scale historical traumas that continue to be perpetuated in large or small ways, such as being told to go back where you came from. Um, and we see this even, we see this in research, we see this in groups, groups that have had horrible um, traumatic things happen in the past. Uh, we see the children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors more susceptible to PTSD. Um, and they've even identified some biological and inherited mechanisms that contribute to that. And cultural trauma in the descendants of Japanese World War II um, internment camp uh, victims and um, Native Americans, um, and this is a picture of Native Americans who were forced into boarding schools which were intended to strip them of their culture. Many um, were abused and um, many and many Native American adults today um, had been forced to attend these boarding schools. Um, and, um, and also we see um, history of lynchings, uh, which occurred not only to African Americans, but also um, to Hispanic Americans as well. Um, there was a, um, lynchings and mass deportations of Spanish-speaking US citizens um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and they were deported in mass um, back in 1936, and obviously these types of abuses continue by, uh, perpetrated by our government today, um, as well as, um, as, as well as the African-American traumatic experience of being kidnapped from Africa, forced into slavery, and um, having to endure um, socially sanctioned abuses, rape, Jim Crow laws, marginalization, and discrimination in the current times. So these are ongoing traumas. They, they, weren't, they didn't happen at one point in time and stop. They continue today. So cultural trauma is a real thing. Um, and when we think about things like psychedelic substances, um, we see that white people have safe spaces to explore the use of these substances, whereas people of color generally do not. Uh, this is a picture of the University of Pennsylvania. I was, um, I was a fa faculty there for four years. Three days a week at night, it was very common to see drunken and high undergrads staggering along the streets of West Philly. And um, the cops were out too. Were they arresting the kids? No, they were protecting them, right? Um, you didn't see the same treatment to the uh, young, to the black youth who were actually in the same neighborhood. So, 
Um, so we've, we come to understand, we realize that the war on drugs is perhaps really a war on people of color, where original, drugs law, original drug laws were intended to target people of color and still do. Uh, policing efforts are heavily biased in favor of minority neighborhoods and people of color. And these assaults have resulted in incarceration and trauma, uh, particularly in black and Hispanic communities. Um, for example, the Justice Department re um, released a report about Baltimore, where they found that African Americans used drugs at comparable rates to other groups, but were arrested uh, at five times the rate of others. So, um, so we know that there's, um, we can demonstrate that there is an imbalance in how um, these rules are enforced. So black and Hispanic men are heavily subject to profiling by law enforcement and as a result may be dealing with stressful legal issues in addition to traumatization. And drugs are often frequently an excuse for humiliating and traumatizing searches and incarceration. And, um, and so when we think about common racial traumas, Police harassment, search, and assault is one of them. In addition to problems like workplace discrimination, we see many people who've been traumatized by discrimination at their workplace in my clinic, community violence, murder of loved ones, incarceration in and of itself is traumatic, as well as not getting adequate medical care or not being adequately treated for pain. And so you may have distressing medical and or childbirth experiences. Um, Racial traumas may also affect um, people of color who are immigrants, such as, and, and, uh, and actually a lot of these can even happen to people who aren't immigrants, but some of these include things like experiencing or witnessing torture, ethnic cleansing and persecution, destruction of cultural practices, living in a war zone, immigration difficulties, and deportation, particularly when families are torn apart. Uh, so, it can often feel like uh, we are assaulted by racism on all sides from many different sources, microaggressions, invalidation, invisibility, lack of respect, hypervisibility, stereotypes, racial profiling, and prejudice, um, and hate. Racial trauma is cumulative. And if, for those of us who have a history, of trauma and our communities are traumatized. We may experience cultural trauma on top of microaggressions and everyday trauma. And then we may have a traumatic event which pushes us from stress to being traumatized. It could be something large or small. Invalidation, when we try to talk about what happened to us and, are, and experience gaslighting. And then structural uh, racism that may manifest as barriers to care. Um, inability to find providers in our communities who look like us or understand our culture, or um, financial barriers. So, so again, trauma is cumulative. Um, one question that, that I have wondered is, can MDMA-assisted psychotherapy help people who are experiencing racial and cultural trauma? We know that it has the potential to heal the wounds of many types of trauma, but uh, racial trauma remains an empirical question, um, keeping in mind that psychedelic healing is only as effective as those who have access to it. And we ask ourselves, who is this movement for, the white elite or everyone? Are we simply replicating the oppression and exclusion seen in our larger society, or are we going to do this right? Um, we know that Black Americans are being left out of psychedelic research, as are many other groups of color as well. And so I say, do black lives really matter? Um, thank you. <laughs> Our lab did a review of the psychedelic research studies to date, worldwide, and found um, exclusion by and large to date, almost all, all white people have been part of these studies, both as patients and as researchers. Um, we're trying, we're responding to this challenge. Um, and I have to say I am grateful, all of us are very grateful that MAPS has been so incredibly supportive of our work and our vision. Um, as part of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study, UConn 
my former institution was a MAP site dedicated to providing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy uh, with a focus on people of color. So that was truly exciting. Uh, this is our research team from UConn. Uh, very diverse, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, this was a short-lived study, I have to say, um, <laughs> because we ran into so many um, institutional barriers and discrimination, and um, even at times our staff were harassed by people at the hospital saying, what are you doing here? Um, because they didn't actually believe we belonged in our own research space, which they gave away twice. Um, so this prevented us from moving forward with phase three. However, I feel like there were a lot of key wins, nonetheless, including raising the, um, these important issues within the psychedelic community, infusing more cultural awareness into the MAPS protocols and procedures as a whole, which I believe has resulted in improvement in the recruitment of people of color throughout the study. And this a wonderful workshop on cultural trauma and unprecedented training for therapists of color. And um, because of this work, I've had the opportunity to um, be part of a national conversation on this issue. And so much good has come out of this. And I've been excited and humbled to be able to talk about this um, coast to coast on all major media outlets um, as well. And I left UConn and found a new job in a more supportive environment um, at the University of Ottawa, where, I, again, I am the, the Canadian Research Chair for Mental Health Disparities and looking forward to having a larger platform. Thank you. Thank you. Larger, larger platform to disseminate my work. Um, and I, got, I have to believe that, that Canada is going to be a little bit better. Uh, they, they did legalize marijuana. So that seems like a good sign for the work ahead <laughs> that I want to do. But uh, the fact of the matter is, no matter where I go, I'm still a black woman, so we'll see. Jury's out, but i um, very hopeful. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to some of our uh, team members. Uh, Sarah, who um, you know is our MC today. Sarah, where are you? Stand up. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Who um, is amazing and working to change the world. Um, other team members include uh, Jamila George, stand up, yeah. Uh, Terrence Ching. And, um, and, and we did a great talk on um, racial trauma and psychedelics at a conference, ISTSS, recently. Um, and we are doing a special issue uh, for the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. And, um, and we're so, we're so excited. So many of you here are involved in some way or contributing to that issue, and that's gonna really also get the word out in the psychedelic and the academic community about this work. And I'm, I'm also um, blessed to have my um, co guest co-editor here, um, uh, Bia Labachi, please stand up. Uh, another, another shout out. She's a fan fantastic, kick-ass Brazilian anthropologist ayahuasca scholar and director of the Jacruna Institute for Plant Medicines, which she's drafted me into their fold. And um, I also wanna put a plug in for the Psychedelic Liberty Summit that's coming up um, in San Francisco. Um, so super, uh, super excited to be part of that work on behalf of people of color. And also we can't forget the next generation of psychedelic therapists who are our volunteers today. Uh, Stand up, stand up, <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and so that's really where the future is. And sometimes you just, I don't know, have to wait for old backwards people to die off and uh, let, let the new blood take their place, myself included. Um, <laughs> so thank you. And, um, and this is a shameless plug for my book that's coming out. <laughs> on eliminating race-based mental health disparities. And so that'll be released soon. And, um, and that's, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for having me. So.